And then I feel like what you're doing with rewilding is like, look, let's like move towards actual reality here. Let's actually acknowledge the like th- so what's happening is happening. We're undergoing a de- so-called decomplexifying uh, a process right now in our culture and society. Let's um, gather and build upon the sk- skills required to weather the storm. And if we do survive for another 500 years, it'll be because of that. Not because people bought more guns right. and felt like their you know rights are being taken away because they have to wear masks or get a vaccine. You know what I mean? Totally. So that's what I, that's my real sense of your work. Yeah. I think that there's a level sort of beyond that even too, which is, you know, um, in, in the, the term weathering the storm, I think it reminds me of sort of this concept of like, we need to build lifeboats to, to save us Uh, from the sinking ship. And I'm not, I'm not interested in building a lifeboat. Um, I'm not interested in, in, building skills specifically to weather a storm because to me it's more about building i mean and and that if you build skills in rewilding you will weather the storm of collapse but it's not the goal of rewilding to weather mm-hmm. the storm of collapse right like right. the goal of rewilding is essentially to embrace wildness and become a part of the ecosystem again which is something that exists beyond a storm forever and Mm -hmm. beyond. Right. So, Mm -hmm. um, in that sense, it's about just, you know, and it's not a lifeboat. It's about finding a new boat. (laughs) If a boat, if a sinking ship is a culture that exists on its own, I don't want a lifeboat that gets me to shore. Like I want to just have another way of living. right? Right. That already is there. And, you know, it's hard to say you could just jump from one to the next, but really it's like ripping a bandaid off. And I feel like there's, you know, again, with examples presented in um, questioning collapse, there's all kinds of um, (laughs) collapse in and of itself is a complex process. Right. And you never know what's going to happen. It's a, it's a wild card, so to speak um, because of all of the different factors at play. So like here in the United States, you know, I think about this a lot versus like the UK or something like there's more guns in the United States than there are people in the United States. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So how is that going to affect a disintegrating society versus like, you know, England or something, you know, that has much less firearm capacity of its civilian yeah. in its civilian arms or something, right? Like everywhere is going to be different. And so we're going to see different things, but, and I don't want to romanticize, you know, people will say, I'm always say I'm romanticizing uh, collapse and that I think it's going to be all everybody holding hands and stuff. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is it's not going to be all horrible, which is what most Mm -hmm. people fixate on, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, to me, there's a level of beauty it comes down to, uh, you know, I think Martine Prechtel, who's a, a, an author I I really enjoy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I saw him speak once when I was a teenager, and he uh, he was talking about how in the Mayan villages where he lived, they had these houses that were kind of they were built out of natural materials, and they would fall apart every couple of years, mm-hmm. and so every few weeks people in the neighborhoods would gather together and rebuild a certain person's house or their roof or whatever, you know, and then a couple of weeks later, do the next person a couple of weeks later, do the next person. And it gave them a reason to come together, work together and have a shared experience of mutual aid. Mm-hmm. But when the government saw that their houses were quote unquote, you know, like shabbily built They came in like an aid organization came in and gave them all like metal roofs so they would stop like decomposing because I think they were like thatched or something. They were like, and then that eliminated the need for mutual aid among the neighbors. And then they all stopped talking to each other and their community Uh, fell apart. Yeah. And so there's this like, you know, 
it's not romantic to say <laughs> that we need each other in these types of situations and that what we evolved with in terms of our human interaction, our necessity for human interaction and mutual aid. Because if you think about if we did truly evolve as nomadic or mobile immediate return hunter gatherers, then we were constantly moving camps, which means we were constantly collapsing our ta- our camps and moving them mm-hmm. and setting them up in another place, which meant we were constantly working together through mutual aid to do that process. Um, and in with sedentism, you don't have that, right? You build brick houses and you don't move. And so you get stagnant and there's no necessity for people to come together and, and help one another in this particular kind of way, but it goes across multi, it's not just with house building or whatever, right? It's like in all the different ways. Um, and so I think in terms of like collapse, what I see happening is a, is a return to people recognizing the necessity for one another and making that happen. That's not to say that there won't be, you know, warring factions or, or whatever. Um, but right. that there's a deeper, a deeper connection that is waiting for us. And I think that is something to celebrate um, in the, the potential fallout. Um, and negative effects. There are also very positive things that we are lacking in contemporary society that will, you know, become, that will be fruitful again. (laughs) Yeah. I think collapse presents openings for something. Exactly. That's what it is. And um, I imagine you and others that are doing work like yours is like creating a base you're kind of accumulating knowledge and uh, knowledges or forms of knowledge and, and skills and just like, hey, like this is available. So right now we can begin that work of preparing in some ways so that as these openings emerge, we're presenting like an alternative to what is actually pretty hor- – like as you mentioned, there's pretty horrifying possibilities that come out of this too. And I feel like people need examples. They have to be shown a little bit, like this is what is possible. And I think we totally. can be often very blinded yeah. to what those possibilities yeah. are. Yeah. And and I, I still think that there's a level of, um, you know, I just question how much energy should I put into any particular thing? Because at the end of the day, people are going to have to figure it out or they're not. <laughs> <laughs> mm, yeah. And so, you know, like earth skills, you know, I, I, I gave up on teaching ancestral skills. Um, I'm not really gave up, but I just put a lot of, I, I don't emphasize that in terms of my own teaching practice much. Um, and again, it's sort of a pendulum for me. I swing back and forth. And right now I'm in the, I'm at the end of the, the crest of doing re, re-education work or, or talking about mythology. I feel myself swinging back towards teaching just ancestral skills and and handwork and stuff Uh, because there's just this constant battle of like what's really the most important thing you know is it to get people to be skilled Mm -hmm. and then recognize when the collapse happens that they're prepared for it or is it to educate people about the story so that then they feel they should be prepared and then inspire them and it doesn't have to be either or right like there's um i think we're (sighs) I think people like having narratives to live by. And so part of the philosophy of rewilding is generating that narrative. Um, But at the end of the day, like that narrative will emerge regardless of whether it does now or later, because it will. I I think, you know, um, I was a huge fan of Joseph Campbell's power of myth. And uh, one of the things that he said in there was that the artist's job is basically to, uh, put people in accord (laughs) with nature through their stories and mythology. And I think that it's not necessarily um, that humans create mythology and then they enact that mythology so much as the environment creates limits that create a narrative. Mm. Um, And in that sense, you know, once our environment limits what is possible for us, our stories are going to do that too. So I don't know. There's just this back and forth with me where I'm, it's a constant um, struggle in my mind of like where to put my emphasis and what will have the most impact. 
And yeah. I don't know, you know, I think it's, I think it's more, mostly like an internal conflict for me, but um, I think that earth skills, planting food, all of that stuff is, is actually very easy. There's mm-hmm. no, like, um, you know, to make a stone tool, you hit a rock together. There's a science behind it. Sure. If you want to get precise, but if you don't know how to make stone tools, you can literally just start smashing rocks together and you'll make one, you'll find a shard that's going to work as a, as a rock knife. And it's yeah. essentially the same with all of those things. Like if, you know, learning to weave a basket is basically just tying knots over and over again. If you can do an overhand knot, you can weave a basket. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. If you can, if you can start a fire, you know, I mean, there's just, it's not hard. These things are are not hard to do. Mm-hmm. So I think that the learning curve is rapid when there's a need. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. you know, again, I think, I mean, think about this too, like the pandemic happened and immediately there was this large cultural, cultural movement, not, not for everybody, but for a lot of people mm-hmm. to produce masks and comfortable mm-hmm. masks, effective masks. And it, it, within like a month, you know, people had like cut up old bed sheets and like, you know, we're stitching masks, masks for healthcare workers and like all this stuff. Like, I think mutual aid is a, um, is a part of the fabric of being human. And I think that it comes out most in absolute need type scenarios. So when a power structure collapses, um, Mm -hmm. that is when there is a strongest need for resources to be distributed among the people who need them. I think the biggest challenge for us, uh, you know, global society is going to be, uh, you know, like you were saying, thinking of collapse as like, you know, there's no more electricity. There's no more of these different things. Like, I think all of that stuff is going to come in waves, you know, Mm -hmm. and it might be one year, it might be one month, it might be whatever. But I think that humans are highly adaptable animals and, we will adapt to those changes and we will do it quickly. And there might be a lot of conflict, but I think that the biggest, the biggest problems with um, society at large in terms of catastrophic collapse are just population density and disease and pandemics have always been the thing that actually really diminishes populations rapidly. And so that's one of the things Mm -hmm. that, You know, I don't really stay up at night worrying about it because I think at the end of the day, you know, I I have a, (laughs) to ease my anxiety over like multiple aspects of collapse, you know, because we have all of these, I think, subconscious myths that are part of us. One is like, I want to live forever. There's like an individual part of it. Like I'm afraid Mm -hmm. of my own death. I'm not afraid of being dead, but I'm afraid of dying, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And then there's, I'm afraid of like humanity's death. Yeah. Like, like I don't want humans to go extinct. Right. Um, and then I'm afraid of like the impact that civilization has had on the planet and all the living things on this planet. Right. So there's like mm-hmm. this coalescence of things. Well, one, I'm going to die at some day anyway. So there's no point in really worrying about it. You just have to accept it. <laughs> That's a hard one. Right. Yeah. yeah. Two, in terms of humanity's death, I have this poster in my basement and it's this giant spiral of life on earth. It's a timeline and it has like, you know, all of the different eras and all the different animals and things, not, you know, not all of them clearly, <laughs> but it goes through like, you know, and it just, it's just this big picture and it's a spiral and it goes all the way back to the beginning of the universe, you know, and with different time points marked on it. And you see like the origin of people, humanity is just this tiny little blip. Um, of all of the life and previous life on the planet. And I just think there's just nothing we can do like that's going to change, you know, the, the process of life in any way. There were six extinctions along that, you know, that we're in the yeah. sixth one, there were five extinctions along that path and still life thrived. Even then, if you think about like the first mass extinction is what produced oxygen. So nothing that is alive today would be alive unless the first mass extinction had happened. I mean, n- nothing that breathes oxygen. Yeah. yeah. And so I think in a million, 500 million years, whatever, the animals and plants that will exist will exist because of 
the transformations that civilization has impacted on the planet because of the impacts that we've made. And so, you know, regardless of the extinctions that we're causing today, there will be life thriving in a million, two million, whatever years that are stoked to be alive and will, in a sure. sense, and will be happy that civilization had the impact that it had that provided the context for those things to thrive in a different world, right? 